Hey everybody, Kim Barnett here in the Carbide 3D Studio with a very different video. You might notice by the background, I'm not staging it entirely. I'm sitting here at my desk and I'm getting ready to design something in Carbide Create. Many of you, when you begin on CNC, you have no background. And I've discovered this in working with many of our customers, some of the first time users, that there's a lot of concepts we could cover in just designing a project. No editing, no cutting everything, not music, none of this stuff that's designed to entertain you and your short attention span these days. This is designed so that you can learn about how the machine and the software relate. How I think about designing a project in the software, how I think about the machine while I'm doing that design, and how you can improve your making. I'm not gonna edit this a bunch, I'm not, I might cut a few things, but mainly this is designed to take you through the absolute process of how this works. I'm gonna have the screen here for my computer. I'll pop up in the screen and screen as we go. I'm talking about tools, strategies, uh, digital tools, physical world tools, all of these things as we go. There's a ton for you to learn here. Let's get started. Let's advance your CNC capability through actually showing you what it is that I do when I'm designing projects here at HQ. Take it into the software. First thing is, inside of Carbide Create, I have the pro version of the software. It's $120 a year. I think it's compelling. We have some other videos and things that cover the features that are in it that are, are outstanding, I believe, for the value. It's 10 bucks a month. I, I think it's worth it. But in any case, I then have the design model and tool pathing tab up above in the top left, along with the basic set of tools. Remember, this is a contextual program, so when you click on things, you will then get different menu options. So pay attention to that as we go. First thing, click the job setup, and that's where you need to start every single project. And it starts with accurate measurements. So in this case, I'm gonna put in my stock, and I'm not so concerned about the length of my stock, because I'm really not gonna use the entire length. I am concerned very much about the width and the thickness. The thickness is the one you really wanna nail. So a couple of tools, that you need to have at your desk, if especially if your desk is not in your garage, okay? A couple of tools you need. A tape measure, but a tape measure for me that contains both metric as well as uh, imperial. I want both of those things on my tape measure because when I think of large pieces, I think in imperial, I think in inches because I grew up in the United States. When it gets down to small things for machining, for dis determining sizes of features, I tend to think in millimeters because it's so much easier. So I have one that has both so that I can accurately get the conception in my brain of what it looks like or what that piece is. So let's take a couple of measurements here right off with our piece of walnut that we have here. So I'm gonna take a measurement across the middle. You have to trust me on this that I'm actually doing that and it is going to be 184 millimeters wide. So into our software, our width is 184 millimeters. Our height, now I'm not so concerned about the height because I'm working with a giant piece of walnut here. I'm just working with a short that I purchased. So I figured that I will probably use two feet of it, let's say. Oh, we're not gonna go further than two feet. So here's where the expression editor can be really fun. In your height, you can put in 24 IN and hit equals. And it will give you the actual number in millimeters if your file is set into millimeters. You can utilize the expression editor throughout the program. I'll show you a number of different places that it appears, but certainly entering measurements is one where you can do that. You can also enter in millimeters in an inches file and it will do the same conversion. Now. We've gotten through our broad measurements. How about the thickness? How do you measure the thickness? You have to have a set of digital calipers. They're like 10 or 12 bucks on the internet. They're super duper cheap. Get a pair of these, get a few pair of these, have them around in your shop, in your office, wherever. And I take a few measurements. So I will grab my piece and I will measure it 20.68, 20.67. 20, I will go again and kind of shake it back and forth, 20.8, 20.62. So you kind of have to take a, a broad average of a few different measurements and take a guess at it. It's wood, it's not going to space, we'll be all right. So I'm gonna go with 20.7 
And I'll show you later a strategy for making sure that you get through the bottom of your cutout. But in any case, 20.7 is our starting number. We're gonna start in the lower left, which is where I start 99% of my projects for the toolpath zero. And remember, this is where your end mill is originating. So this is where your end mill thinks it starts for the project where your zero is in the software. It thinks it is the lower left corner of the way you've set your stock. Uh, my retract height, I like to go with three millimeters. I keep it fairly low. You can have it be higher if you like. It just means that some operations, particularly a V-carve, will take much, much longer as the machine retracts between those little pieces of a V-carve. So I'm working in millimeters and hardwood shape Oco Pro is my option here and I will hit OK. So I have this piece here that is now tall and a little bit wide. Looks a lot like a walnut short. All right, so I wanna move into my design. Now, in the upper left, there are a variety of design tools and you can choose between what you want, depends on what you're making. What am I making? That's the question, right? I was trying to think of something to make and I wanted something where I'd have to have a number of shapes that we can manipulate and move. Coins are one of my favorite little projects I like giving them away, they're fun to make, they're quick. You can do a lot of fun design with them. They are metal, you can make them out of wood too. You can make wooden nickels, it's up to you. So I thought I might make a holder for completed coins, like this one here, and then some extra coin blanks, which is what I have here. So I want some blanks on the side, we'll have to have some pockets, we'll also have to orient some spaces for some finished coins. Something if you were gonna say sell some coins at a local craft fair or display some coins if you were selling them online on Etsy or something. Uh, coins are a really fun uh, constrained design project. You're gonna work within this little framework and just see how many different ways you can get creative with it. Right on. So we want a tray for that. I'm gonna zoom in here on our stock and we're gonna make a walnut tray because walnut and brass or walnut and copper look very cool. Let's start with the outer outline of our tray. And so we draw a rectangle and we move our rectangle around here to inside of our stock. I want to leave a little bit of space on the edges for clamping. I don't want to use double-sided tape. I want to be able to clamp around the outside of the project. Let's think about our size here and as it relates to our stock, because you not only have to think about the size of your object, but you have to think about how that size relates to the piece of stock you're gonna cut it out of. So let's look at our grid setup. I like to keep my grid pretty small at one millimeter, two millimeters, something like that. I'm gonna leave it at one millimeter right now and hit okay. With this piece, it's 176 wide right now. Let's just go 170. And how about a height? I don't know, 170, 84 is pretty close to exactly half of that, right? Go 85, should be a nice proportion. And we can position this so that we have room for standard essential clamps that can put their feet right on the edges of this board and we can have some pretty stock standard, really easy work holding. There's our general outline. How about what we want to do overall with our coins and how many we have finished versus how many we have that are unfinished. Or if we want to have some that are displayed that are all finished coins and we have some other coins that we want to lay there, we don't want everything to be flat. We'd like some of them to be stood up on end. So we have a, a row of them somewhere and we have some coins flat elsewhere. Let's think about our measurements here. We take our coin blank and we again are back to our calipers. We zero them out and we're gonna measure our coin blanks. So these coin blanks, 31.82 right now, that's where we're at, 31.82, about 31 millimeters. And these are gonna be pretty close, 31.8 again. I know from my work holding with these coins that I can make a 31.8 millimeter circumference and I can press fit coins into there. I don't want to press fit anything. I want it to be a little bit bigger. So I'm going to go say 32.2 and we'll see how that turns out. We'll give a little bit of clearance. So I'm going to create a circle and we work in radius here. So the radius 32.2. 
figure it out. Yeah, you can do it quick, right? 16.1. Okay, I understand. But you don't have to do that. If you don't want to do the math in your head and type 16.1 as your radius, what you can do is type 32.2 divided by 2 equals, and it will give you 16.1. Here, pretty easy because the math is not that hard, but when you start dealing in tiny little fractions, yeah, use the divide by 2. Use the expression editor. So we have our initial horizontal display for our coins. Let's now look at a vertical display. So I would like to make a rectangle, back to making a rectangle, and I'm thinking on the left-hand side, we'll put in some coins, but now that I think about it, I want to go to the right-hand side, so drag it over to the right. We know what our diameter is, right? Our diameter is at 32.2, and so whatever we put in here, we would need a diameter somewhat like that. So our width, let's just go 33. We'll leave ourselves a little bit of room. Height of 72. For now, that looks like a good proportion. So we have our, our little area for vertically stacked coins or blanks. Let's put out a few of these. Command C, Command V, Control or Command, you can duplicate items. You also have an option to duplicate by bringing up the duplicate menu, Command or Control D. You can bring up the duplicate menu for the highlighted vector that you have. You can tell it to keep groups, keep toolpath links, keep the current layer active. We haven't d dove into layers just yet, so right here we'll just leave all of that with it up. We can go ahead and just start clicking, and we will be creating duplicates of the vector that we had selected. Go ahead and hit done. I have six of these guys here. Now, arranging things in Carbide Create can be a little tricky, can be really easy. It just depends. So we're going to grab these two, and we're going to align them. Your alignment tool is on the left-hand side about in the middle, it's in the middle of the transform selections, and anything you hover over will show you what tool it is. Rotate, mirror, group, align vectors. We're gonna select align vectors. And right now in the align vectors, we are going to align to the dotted line vector, which is the last vector you have selected on your screen. So what will happen is when we tell it to align centers horizontally, this lower one is going to move to meet the upper one. You're going to spend a lot of time thinking about which piece is moving because you're going to set pieces in places that you want them, that you want them to stay, and you're going to want to align other pieces to that. You're not going to want to shift over the piece that you've already gotten perfectly placed in your design. As your designs get more complicated, this will become increasingly important. So we're gonna align horizontal and you'll see the bottom one move ever so slightly. So these are aligned vertically. Now we have a couple of options here. I could delete all of these and I can simply take these two and I can duplicate them. Say Command D and I can put two more of them down. Now I know that these are directly above one another the same way that we have aligned our first set. Command Z, Command Z to eliminate those, Command Z to get back to where we were with our previously singularly duplicated items. If you want to continue down the road of aligning these vertically, you can do that. You can then, you'll have to align them horizontally as well. Let me show you a strategy for creating an array of this type of thing more quickly. Take these two, group them. So now whenever we select them, they are one item. Let's duplicate them. One, two. We now have three grouped vectors. So effectively, these are three objects that I can select. I know that the distance between these two is the same because I did it in this particular one, our original one. So now I'm left only to align these three items vertically. I'm now horizontally aligned with everything. These are vertically aligned with one another, and these are now horizontally aligned with one another. Here's where we need to make a few adjustments. So we don't have, right now, a tool for space evenly. You'll see that in some software, particularly Adobe Illustrator, 
where you can space evenly from side to side. We don't have that right now. So you need to create some guides. It's not really that hard. You're just gonna go ahead and create a square. And then we'll drag that square up. And if I like this distance between the two, I can go ahead and resize my square. And you're done. And now I can select the square along with our group here on the left. And I want to align to the outer edge. So now this square rectangle is aligned to the outer edge of this group here. So now I want this group to move to be aligned with the outer edge of this particular vector here, our guide. I will select our guide last, and I will now move this to align with the outer edge here, like so. So these are now evenly spaced apart, whatever the distance of this particular rectangle is that we have set, in this case, six millimeters. So it's six millimeters wide. Why don't we duplicate this piece, and we will align it to our current guide vertically, just for fun, you don't actually have to. And then we will take our new guide and we will align it to our middle set of circles. It is now aligned with the outer edge of our center. And we can grab our node here and we can align it to the midpoint of our guide. So you notice I manually moved this right side group that's something you can choose to do, or you can use the alignment tools the way we have. So these are now six millimeters apart, evenly spaced vertically from one another because these three were all the same selection and we duplicated them. We now have this little array. What if I don't want to look at these guides that I've created? This is where you need to use the Layers tab. Hit the L key, it'll bring up layers. Simply add a layer. I always have a guides layer. Hit OK. Guides in red. Red's not the best color necessarily. Let's go with a mustard. And I have those two guides selected. So I'm going to sell it to move selection to layer. You'll notice these are now green. And the real advantage to layers is I can show or hide them. I'm gonna hide them right now. They're still there, but we don't need to look at them while we're making choices about the rest of our parts. If you wanna make sure that they move with your parts, you can keep them up there for a while. And for instance, when I grab all of this, I can move all of these together. But generally speaking, I will get rid of guides as I no longer need them and not worry about what their position is later. One of the things I do do while I'm working through a project is periodically I will grab all of my vectors and I'll copy them and throw them out to the side. I have therefore a version of my project at some earlier point. I often change things at the end of a project, but I need a middle point in order to more easily change them for the endpoint that I'm looking for. I don't wanna to have to go and recreate the wheel because sometimes you're making changes to parts of the vectors on here and pieces of your design and we don't have a, a tree of previous history. It's not parametric modeling. So I like to keep little pieces out to the side. And you can complain now about how this isn't the way the software should work or I want more or whatever. Yeah, there's other things out there that are more expensive. This is how the software works. Whether it's this software or somebody else's software, you have to figure out how the software works, the way it thinks, the way you think, and the way the machine moves and put all those together. Doesn't matter what it is, you still need to figure these things out. So a lot of these strategies are exactly that. Take your art, throw it out to the side once in a while. You have unlimited space, use it. Hey, future Kevin jumping in here for just a second. I want you to watch out when you're copying and pasting elements and putting them off to the side, as I just recommended. You have to be sure that there are not toolpaths assigned to those vectors. When you copy and paste, when you duplicate, the toolpaths you've already set 
are going to be applied to any of those elements that you've copied and pasted. So you can see this when you zoom out, you'll see it in just your regular toolpaths and then in your simulation, you'll see rapids and cuts. Be aware of that. Look and see if your machine is tracking off to some weird spot if there are extra lines. Take a look. One other note, I did rotate this project 90 degrees. It made the cut a lot easier. It was better positioned on the wood and Anytime you can cut with the grain for the majority of your object, it's gonna work out better. So we want to go this direction with the grain versus across the grain. You'll get a lot less twist. You'll get a lot less variation in the wood. Because anytime you cut wood, especially like a walnut, you will release tension in the board. If you go with the grain for the majority of your item, your item is gonna stay straighter a lot more times than it will twist and bow and do all kinds of other weird things. Remember, wood is not a static, stable item. MDF is, it doesn't have any twist or warp. A walnut, beautiful as it is, has twist and warp. All right, back to it. I'm gonna temporarily group this entire set of vectors here. So this will have an effect on our layers. I'm going to group these vectors and you'll notice now it pulls everything onto the guides layer. Don't worry about that too much. The reason I grouped them is so that I can align them with the outer Spons. cutout or the outer contour of our part. And I'm going to align it vertically. Now it is exactly aligned vertically. I can go back and ungroup everything here and I can grab my three pieces. Go to the layers panel, panel and move the selection to the layer. I'm going to rename this layer as a matter of fact our main design. Name things, whether they're layers or toolpaths, you'll be very happy when you get into complex designs with a lot of features that you named your layers, you named your toolpaths, you named your groups. All of this becomes increasingly important as you work. All right, okay. I've now centered this inside of this rectangle. Let me decide what I wanna do with this particular rectangle here. I'm gonna center it to the outer rectangle because I don't want the outer vector to move. So I'm gonna center that vertically. Very good. And now this guy, I'm gonna decide how far I want it away from here. I might wanna put in another set of guides. So if I take and make a guide here, I'm gonna make it nine millimeters wide. So I have a nine millimeter guide that I wanna pull longer here so I can just visually check that all of this is gonna line up. I'm gonna pull this guide pretty long, nine millimeters wide. Okay, very good. I wanna duplicate that and I wanna stick it over here and I want it to sit on the edge of my outer vector. So I've aligned these two new pieces which are designed to be guides. So I move them to the layer. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to align all of these in their hole to the edge of this guide. So I'm gonna group them and I'm gonna select that guide and then align to the edge. Now it's nine millimeters from the external edge of my part cutout. I wanna take this part here and I wanna do the same thing, but I'm gonna to align to the outer edge on the other side with our align tools in the upper left and hit align. No matter what you're doing inside the software, Practice is going to be key. You're just gonna to have to make a lot of stuff to remember all of these commands that I'm going through. Even though I'm gonna go through them slowly here, they're not all gonna stick. Just practice, you got it. I wanna show you one quick trick with selections and Carbide Create. I didn't know this for a while. If I select down, it will select any vector that I wholly put within the selection box. Watch this. I have touched these vectors on the left-hand side, but I'm not getting them selected. I'm only selecting those that are completely within the box. This is not how something like Illustrator works. Illustrator works that any vector you touch, it selects. Carbide Create has that same ability. If you drag a box up, now it will grab anything it touched. You can see it grabbed the outer contour when I went all the way up. This time I didn't go all the way up, it didn't grab all of them. This is a handy tool when you're trying to select, say, this entire circle, but not the two sides. Yeah, you're gonna get the group that you are going over, 
but not these two guides. But if you go up, you get all of them. So that's just one of those fun things to remember when you're trying to, inside of a complex design, select a minute portion of it, or maybe a larger group of something, then you can go ahead and go up or down. Don't mind the banging. We're making machines here today, as we are every day. All right, let's sort this back out. Now that we have it vertically aligned, center to our outer contour, and we decided we wanted it nine millimeters from the edge, and we did that, let's get our three groups here and move them back to the layer upon which they belong. Move selection to layer, hit OK. Everything's on the layer that it belongs. Let's get rid of our guides. We'll just hide them. And now they're gone. So here's our basic design. And we're just going to have six coins. We're going to display them flat. And we're going to have a row of coins here on the right. Let's take a look at our tool pathing and what we want to do with our tool pathing now that we've created this object. How do we want to machine all of these objects? How does the program and the machine think about where things are? How do you think about where things are? All right. This stock that we said at the beginning, any area that contains the grid, that is the stock that you set up. So if I take a look at show simulation, then we have to have a tool path. Let's create a tool path. We'll use current selection. We'll cut outside right. I'll talk about that in a second. Let's look at our simulation. Anytime you have a tool path that's been created, you will see your stock. There is the piece of stock that it thinks is in the machine. You can have it show in any one of several different materials. I sometimes find that the contrast in one material is better than another for whatever it is that I'm working on. But this is so you can get an idea of what it's going to look like when you produce it. I spent a lot of time using the beach. I think beach is pretty good. And it will show you the toolpaths, it will show you the rapids. Toolpaths are in green, and toolpaths are the actual cutting motions that the machine will be taking to run the bit through the material. Rapids are these red guys. This is where the machine is taking the cutter and entering the material or going between one entry point or exit point and the next entry point. Okay, so it's picking up and it's going and putting itself in, making a cut, then it's exiting that cut at some point and going to the beginning of the next cut and entering the material again and beginning the next cut you'll be able to see those and dissect those. You can also see the number of cuts it's making, and this is being determined by your depth of cut. So if you change your depth of cut, you'll get a different number of times around a particular vector. All right, we'll play with that in just a moment. Let me get out of the simulation. Let me delete this, which we had there just to show you how the stock works. And I generally start on the interior of my project. And this is because you want to create all of your interior features before you cut it out, before you cut out the object. You don't want the object loose in space if you're making an entire cutout and maybe using super glue and blue tape or double-sided tape to hold it there. And then trying to feature it and cut it, you're going to fling the part. You also don't want giant tabs on the side of your project, perhaps. So even if you're using tabs, they're probably not that big because you don't want big marks on your finished product on the outer contour. So you want to make your tabs smaller. They're going to be weaker. And again, you don't want to be putting a bunch of cutting forces into the middle of your project. So I like to feature everything on the project first. Inside, all those features get made, then cut it out. And if you make your cutout first for purposes of simulation, fine. We can always reorder the toolpaths. That's another step that we'll talk about in a little bit. Or maybe I'll forget and we won't talk about it and you'll have to ask about it in the comments. Please ask, please. We're here to help. I'm here to help. Uh, I definitely think you can do it. I, I'm definitely behind you. We think this is something that you're really going to enjoy doing. All right. Select our circles. How deep do we want to cut our circles? Well, that's going to depend on 
the thickness of our coins. Do we want to be able to grab them? Do we not want to be able to grab them out of the pouches they're going to sit in? All right, 3.21. Yes, 3.21. How deep do I want to cut these particular features? What if I want to be raised up just a tiny little bit? Why don't we make some pockets? We will use the current selection. That is the six circles. And you notice it throws in some toolpaths just as we start to define our toolpath. With defined toolpath, you first have your tool up top. Then you have the vectors selected, which we did before we came into the toolpath. That's anything highlighted in orange. Then we have our start depth, which in most cases is zero, but in some other cases, you're gonna be adding to the bottom of a pocket. So you want to make a pocket and then a feature within that pocket. Your depth, your starting depth would be equal to the bottom of the pocket you previously cut. In this case, we're starting from the top of our material. We're going to go ahead and just cut down. The other significant scenario where you would have a different starting depth is if you wanted to, in a single operation, put your wood in the machine, your stock in the machine, and you wanted to face it off a certain amount and then begin featuring it. So let's say I want to take one millimeter off the top of it. I would take my one millimeter off and then every cut after that would start from one millimeter because you've already gotten rid of that amount of material and it would go from say one to four millimeters to make a three millimeter deep pocket. Make sense? Hope so. Here, I'm not putting a facing path in. We're going to zero our machine to the very top of our stock and we're going to cut from there. So I want to cut from the start depth of zero to a final depth of three millimeters. Here, you can use the expression editor as well. You could put in 0.25 IM and hit equals, and it will show you that is 6.35 millimeters. But it is a small measurement, so that's what I'm working with. Three millimeters, I work in metric and small. Ramping, an option in Carbide Create Pro, extremely handy. If you're cutting hardwoods a ton, or if you're cutting metal a ton, you, you can utilize ramping and it will give you an angle. And then from that angle, it will determine if it needs to ramp in along a line or if it needs to helically enter the material. Set up some ramping passes, try them out. You'll see what I mean. The angle is the angle of entry. So that angle is coming slowly down or more vertically down and a plunge would be a 90 degree entry that's in standard car by create is a 90 degree entry so here i don't know 15 degrees unnecessary probably for your again uh, it would be fine plunging but we'll use it rest machining we're not using rest machine that's another fantastic feature inside pro where you can use small cutters to create corners sharper corners and that allows you to hog out material with a larger cutter and save time i'll show you how to set that up in just a minute all right what is our first tool path these are center set, center circles. How about that? Center circles. I didn't edit the tool. It had a one eighth. I think that's a pretty good tool for this. But well, we can select our tool. Inside of the select tool option, which is brought up by hitting edit, and then it will show you the parameters for your current tool, and then going to select tool, this opens up a menu which contains all the carbide 3D end mills and any end mills you've entered by machine and material, then end mill. So for instance, we're working on a Shaboko. We're gonna work in hardwood. So I wanna pull that drop down open. Our end mills, we're working with the flat end mills, not the ball end mills that are standard or the V-carve end mills, which we'll get to in a minute. We'll get to the bees. Let's work with the end mills and let's go up to a yeah, quarter inch. I'll use a 251. That's a down cut end mill. Down cut end mills are really nice for wood. That's what you want to use. But okay, here are the standard settings for that end mill. Standard step over, which is equal to one half of the actual end mill size because it's a quarter inch end mill, right? Which we know is 6.35. So we've cut it down, step over 3.1. It's gonna step over half the size of the end mill. It's gonna cut a little more than a millimeter per pass. These are conservative calculations we already have pre-programmed. Our plunge rate is 304 and our feed rate is 1500. 
The 251 is a two flute end mill. So you don't have three cutting surfaces, you only have two cutting surfaces. It is a quarter inch end mill, so generally I feel like I can cut a little bit deeper. I'm gonna cut 1.5 deep. I'm gonna plunge at 550 because I'm gonna use ramping, so it'll be a little bit easier. I'll leave the feed rate the same. I'll leave the RPMs the same, 18,000. Hit okay. Center circles, we've selected our tool. We know our vectors because we had those at the start. We've changed our start depth for, We've set our start depth at zero and three, and our entry angle is 15 degrees. Hit okay. And there you can see how much more quickly it's going to cut with a quarter inch versus an eighth inch cutter. That's two minutes. What is our, our group here? Let's create our group. Let's rename it and call it uh, inner features. So now we've named our group and we have our first tool path. I would name that. Let's also pocket this toolpath here. Let's say we want to use the same cutter with the same parameters, but on this pocket. We select the pocket itself, right click, hit duplicate toolpath. We'll call this right side rectangle. We'll use the selected vectors, which means it will assign the duplicated toolpath to this vector. Hit OK. And you see now it calculates in. It's going to use all the same settings from here in terms of depth of cut, in terms of the tool and the ramping, and it applied them here to our right side rectangle. See, three, three millimeters, quarter inch tool, all the same. Ramping at 15 degrees. Hit OK. There we go. Now, here's where I want to duplicate a toolpath and use REST machining. Check this out. So if we go into our simulation, we have these pockets here. Let's get rid of our toolpaths and rapids. You'll notice the edges here of this rectangle are not coming in very sharp. Those are not at all the way they were drawn. So. In a circle, it doesn't matter what size cutter it is that you use, right? Because you're just cutting a circle. Here, you are limited to the radius of the cutter when it comes to sharp corners. The smaller the cutter you use, the tighter that radius gets. The problem is, you use a tiny cutter to pocket out this entire area at three millimeters. You have to cut a shallower depth of cut, and you're cutting a tiny amount of material each time by. So I wouldn't want to spend all this time taking what should be a two minute cut and turning it into a 15 minute cut with say a 1 16th inch end mill. So what can I do? I've cut it with a quarter inch, it was super fast, but I want sharper corners. I want these corners to look nice and sharp here the way they do in my drawing. Here's what we can do. With no contours selected, right click your right side like the rectangle and duplicate the tool path. You cannot use selected vectors because you haven't selected them. Now, I will do this. I will hit rest, right side rectangle, and hit OK. It has simply duplicated that toolpath. It's changed nothing. All I changed was the name. Go in and edit. I'm going to leave all this the same for the moment, and I'm going to hit rest machining. Now, previous diameter is critical. That's why I didn't change the tool yet. It's a quarter inch, 6.35 millimeters. Do I know if that stock setting it came in with is equal to my end mill that I previously used? Maybe I don't. Maybe I used an eighth, right? Maybe this end mill, the tool in the previous cut was an eighth. I can simply put in 0.125 IN equals, and it will do the math for me. In this case, it was a quarter inch. I can put in 0.25 IN for inches equals 6.350. It's asking you what tool did I use before this operation. During this operation, you now need to change the tool you're actually going to use. So let's go to edit, select our tool again. We'll be back into Shape Oko Hardwood. We're going to use an end mill again. In this case, let's use a 16th, a 112, 1 16th inch end mill. Let's go for some sharp corners. We'll hit OK. 
And you can see how different the cutting parameters are here. It's going to cut a half a millimeter. It's going to cut much slower. And its plunge rate is also equally slow. And the step over is tiny because the cutter is tiny. You wouldn't want to cut the entire pocket with it. So in this case, 1 16th, I'm going to change nothing about the settings. We already have all of our other parameters established. I hit OK. And here are the toolpaths for that particular new toolpath, the rest. You notice it's only going to cut the corners just along those four corners. It's going to come back and recreate them. Let's take a look at our simulation. And there we go. Sharper corners. There's still a radius of a sixteenth, but that sure beats the radius of a quarter inch. So we have much sharper corners there. You cannot do that in regular Carbide Create. You can only do it in Carbide Create Pro. Let's hide our simulation. We have yet to cut out the outside of our project. Let's, get, let's do that. Let's create a new, new toolpath group. We'll name this group. Outer features. Well, out features, no. Outer features. Now, anything we create is going to end up in this toolpath group. We'll select our outer vector, and we'll make it a contour. We will use current selection. We want to cut outside right. That one always comes to mind for me right away. Do I want to cut inside left, outside right, or no offset? That's asking where should the cutter run? Inside of the vector that you've selected? outside of the vector you've selected or directly down the middle of the cutter. Outside right is for a cut out. So you'll see the blue is going to come around. It's going to go outside of our chosen size for our contour around the outside of our object or creating the outside of our object. If we go inside left, it will run inside of that contour. It's going to make the part smaller. You'll make this mistake. We all do. You don't make that selection properly and you end up with a part that's too small. It happens to all of us. Now it's with a 16th inch cutter because that was the last cutter we worked with. That is certainly not what we're going to use to cut out our 20 millimeter thick sheet of walnut. We need a quarter inch cutter and we probably just go right back to the same 251. Hit OK. I'm going to leave all the parameters as they are. Now about our thickness. We could go back into the setup and look up our thickness because I don't remember it at this point. Do you? Down to the millimeters? No, I never do by this point. I remember it was some fraction of 20 in this case. Okay, fine. Expression editor, definitely handy. Type in T. T is for thickness. So you're telling it now, I want you to cut to whatever the thickness measurement is that I entered in this job setup at the very start of the program. T will take you to that number. Now let's assume that you did not zero your machine exactly 100% correct. Let's also assume that even though this is wood that's three sides good, it's not exactly that thick all the way through. In fact, we know that because we pulled in our calipers at the very start and we got a few different readings and we kind of chose a sort of average of that. Good. And T plus 0.1. Here's an option where the expression editor really comes in handy. You can tell it, I want to go to thickness plus 0.1 millimeters. For me, that generally covers the majority of projects. If I zero properly, a plus 0.1 will make sure that I get through the bottom of the project. In a lot of cases, I don't even go through the tape if I'm using double-sided tape on the bottom. Nothing. It just goes right above it. You see a nice blue line appear at the bottom of your project. That's perfect. You might scar your wasteboard with a T plus 0.5. You're going to put a half a millimeter cut into your wasteboard. Yeah, it's a wasteboard. That's what it's for. It's supposed to do that. So you can mess with this. You can also allows you to create pockets relative to the bottom of your stock. If you wanted to say, I want a pocket that is two millimeters from the bottom of my stock. You don't have to worry about, did I enter the right number? Is that 18.6, 18.5? No. You could put in T minus three, let's say. So now what it will do is cut from the top of the stock 
to three millimeters above the bottom of the stock. It's a great way just to make pockets that have a defined bottom. Sometimes you just want to define the bottom of the pocket or the feature, not the top down measurement. You're worried about the bottom up measurement. Quick way to do it. In this case, we're going T plus 0.1 because we're making a cutout. We're doing it outside right. We've selected our quarter inch end mill. We already had our vector selected before. We're gonna use ramping again. We're gonna do it at 15 degrees. We don't have any tabs right now on our project. I'll show you that in a second, and we'll call this outer cone out. Will it okay? So we have our inner features. We have our outer features. We have an outer cutout after all of our inner features. Let's take a look at our simulation. And we have a tray. There we go. We've created a basic tray with some basic shapes. Now, a few things come to mind when you pull up the simulation. Hey, look, we duplicated this toolpath that we were using for these circles, the pocket, and this pocket ended up three millimeters deep. That's not gonna hold these coins. We need probably half the distance of the coin, right? Or so, 16-ish millimeters. Yeah, 16-ish millimeters. Let's do that. Hide our simulation. Could be 16, could be more. Maybe I want three millimeters on the bottom. So let's change this pocket. Max depth, T. Minus three millimeters. And let's take a look at our simulation. Now we have a pocket that goes all the way down to within three millimeters of the bottom of our stock. Now one problem we have. See our rest machining pass here? That's not gonna work, is it? And the reason it's still at three millimeters because we haven't changed it. But I can tell you this, the 16th inch end mill, yeah, is not gonna cut down 18 millimeters, 17 millimeters, not that long. So let's get rid of that rest machining pass. When we look at our simulation again, and now we have some rounded corners, but we have a nice deep pocket. So there's a trade-off, and you're gonna find these trade-offs all the time. We know that a 16th inch end mill only goes a few millimeters in its flute length. An eighth inch end mill, it can cut that distance. Why don't we try that, see how that tightens up. We'll re-enable and we'll edit. We'll select our tool. We'll go to Shape Oco, Hardwood, end mills, a 102. This will be about the limit of a 102 perhaps. We'll hit okay. We're again back to getting those little cutouts, show our simulation. And while they're not as, oh, look at that. We only went three millimeters, hang tight. T minus three. Show simulation. This is why you need to use simulation because things will need to be altered. There we have it. Nice, clean corner. So our pocket is now looking like it could actually ho hold a row of blanks or other coins. Okay. Next, I want to make some alterations to the outside. You notice how sharp these corners are? CNC machines have cut sharp corners. They're no fun. Let's change that. Let's cruise back to the design side of Carbide Create and look at what our options are for that outer outline. This outline, when you make a rectangle or a square, you are given the corners option in the upper left. Square, fillet, chamfer, flip fillet, dog bone and tee. You can change it to any one of these just to experiment with it, just to see what it looks like. And then you can change this value here, which is the radius. Okay. And I advocate for moving it to extremes. So if you want to move it to something wild like 100, great. And you end up with this weird shape but at least you start to understand what it does. Chamfer, fillet, square, let's go fillet, and let's just round the edges a little bit, two millimeters, just to take the, the sharp edge off of it. If we go back to our tool paths, we look at our simulation, that looks a lot better. 
that sharp edges are not nice on products generally. So the more you can fill in edges and cut them in, the better. And on outer edges, you're always gonna get a sharp corner. On inner edges, like say I wanted that quarter inch fillet here, I could just not worry about it because I would have the quarter inch fillet in there. I'm using a quarter inch bit. It would only be the radius of that bit and I would be okay with that. I didn't have to mess with rest machining or something else. This is where you need to know what the cut looks like in person and what the machine can do and put those together in your design ideas. You don't have to have everything programmed in. Some of it can just be, you know how it behaves. You know what the result will be. There's been a hundred years plus of machining with mills. And years ago for, I don't know, near a hundred years of that, 75, 85 years of that, you didn't have a CNC machine. You didn't have a CAD drawing to work off of. You didn't have this visualization of the future that you could see. You had to know what the tools did. So as long as you know what the tools do, you can know what the result will be. The simulation is a bonus, but don't completely absolve yourself of knowing what it's gonna be when the tool actually goes to work. The only way you know that is by actually working with the tools, making projects, making designs, trying again. What if I do this? What if I do that? What if I apply this tool in that way? I encourage you to experiment. All right, let's take a look back here. We've done that on the edges. So we've taken those edges away. Now, sharp edges are no fun anywhere. Where else do you see sharp edges here? You've got a sharp edge right along the top edge here, a sharp edge here, sharp edges here. Everything's all sharp. Chamfers. Back to design. Back to our inner elements here, our inside elements. Let's select all of those. All right. Now, let's use the offset vectors over here offset vectors we want to offset inside each one of these vectors and i want to offset 0.9 millimeters why 0.9 well because i know that 0.9 is going to work for my 301 v bit number 301 90 degree v once it has made those lines they're all selected let's go to layers we need to add a layer and we're gonna call this our chamfers layer. We're gonna use the layer for the machining in just a moment. Hit okay. And uh, we'll let it use maroon. Maroon will be fine. It'll be good. We'll tell it to move selection to layer. Hit okay. And now we have some maroon lines inside of our black lines, which are our main design, that are our chamfers. We're chamfering the inside of each of these sections and we're going to chamfer the outside. We're setting up the, the lines for this. So same operation, the offset path, but it's going to be 0.9 millimeters outside. Hit apply. Bring up the layers panel with the L and move selection to layer. Hit OK. Great. Now we have a whole bunch of chamfers out there or chamfer paths. Now we have to actually make chamfers. Back to our tool paths. When would we want to make these chamfers? My discussion earlier about cutting forces. Chamfers, not a ton of cutting forces. Chamfers in wood, could you cut with the V-bit first? Yes, you can. I just wouldn't drive it all the way down. I would keep my step downs smaller, but you can absolutely run a V-bit into wood as the first cut and then come around and cut the contour. When it comes to metal, Generally, you don't want to do that. Generally, I want to chamfer after the cut, not before the cut. The other advantage of chamfering after the cut is you're really taking away any of those fuzzies that you left behind, any of those chips that welded onto the edge, any of the imperfections, and you can change the depth. You already know what the cut looks like. You can play with that. But in this case, I want to do it first. So I'm going to go to contour select by layer because I have nothing selected. I'm going to select the chamfer layer and hit OK. The amount of chamfer is up to your preference and your experience. I'm going to go down one millimeter. With a 90 degree bit, one millimeter down, should create an OK chamfer. I'm going to have no offset. We've already created the offset by virtue of the offset path. Where we put the contours is where we want the bit to come down. So we're gonna come down right on that line. It's gonna be no offset at all. 
We want to ignore tabs because I think we're going to add some tabs here in a second. And we don't want it to be picking up and then putting down on our chamfers. And we'll call this chamfers all. We need to edit our bit. We will select our tool, shape oco, hardwood, V, and I'm gonna use a 301 90 degree. It's one of my favorites, kind of a nice mid-century modern look. And you know what? I'm gonna run it faster. It's not gonna run at a thousand. If I can type it in, I'll run at a thousand. And I'm gonna plunge at 500. Depth per pass. Now here's where you can set up a really nice finishing pass. Total depth, one millimeter, right? I want a 0.1 millimeter finishing pass. So what should my depth of cut be? 0.9. That will create a situation where the cutter will have to go around twice. The second one, it will be cutting just a 10th of a millimeter, just smoothing everything out. Hit okay. I'm gonna pull my chamfers up here above my outer cutout. I'm gonna cut it first. I'm gonna show the simulation. And I can zoom in and see if we got the intended effect. We're not getting any contact between the 90 degree bit and the place that it's running. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to create more chamfer depth. Two millimeters. This is why simulation is very good. Now we look in and look at that. We have a definite chamfer around each one of our coins and around the inside of our pockets as well as the outer part of our part. That all looks better. Are we happy with that design or are we not happy with that design? That's my question. Maybe I'm not happy with the design. I don't want to change it. In my design dialog, let's make the chamfer layer disappear. Let's hide it. How are we going to get these coins up easily? How are we going to pry them out of there at all easily if they're in these little insets and it's almost the death of the coin? Well, I'll tell you, it's not going to be easy. So, what I want to do is create these little guys here. So, I'm going to create a little cutout, a little half circle cutout. This means I have to use the Boolean tools, but I want everything to look the same. Let's take a look. Let's grab this, make another one. Let's put it right on the node. Each circle is cons consists of a node. So if you know that, you can actually align center by the node of what you're working with. So you grab the center node of a circle and you add it to the outer node of this bigger circle and you know that that's going to be centered and if it's centered right here this will be all vertically aligned each one of those will be vertically aligned we can do the same thing down below and we can actually take all three and we'll grab the center one by its center and we'll hit the node and now all those should also be perfectly aligned we can check it by seeing if these are aligned with one another. Let's see if they move. Didn't move. We use the align that did not move. We select these two groups, and we go to Boolean. Now, we're gonna Boolean the two groups together. Blue is gonna stay, orange is going away. How about that? That looks pretty good. The well is gonna produce the same. This is the inverse. That's gonna create some tiny little pieces. That's not what we want. Several of these are gonna produce different results. This is not what we want either. We would like the circles contained. We would like that outer outline. Much okay. And just like that, we have something that looks a little bit easier to pull coins out of than our previous set of tool paths. Now, you'll notice that our previous set of features You'll notice here that our toolpaths have not changed. We have toolpaths in here for the chamfers that are not correct. Let's go back out to design. 
We're going to add all of these to our selection. Let's add chamfers. Offset path, same deal. Inside, 0.9, hit apply. Layers, move selection to layer. Let's show that layer. Let's get rid of the old chamfers. All those plain circles. Those are gone, so we have chamfers now on those new vector shapes that we came up with. And let's go to our two pads. How about this? We already have these chamfer lines inside our chamfer toolpath. Because you're machining by layer, anything you add to that layer automatically is part of that machine function, part of that toolpath. Our center circles right now isn't cutting anything. We're not creating this pocket the way we were before. So let's go ahead and select all of these outer pieces. And we could have grouped these. We could have regrouped them to make it easier. Let's do that. Group, tool paths, center circles. Change our vectors. This is where you can select the current vectors. You can change your vectors. You can say use current selection and say OK. And just like that there, we have returned our pocket tool paths. Let's take a look at our simulation. Now we have that new shape being cut out. Something that'll be a little bit easier to remove the coins from. We also have those new chamfers all set up. We still have our same rounded corners here. We have our chamfer along the outer corners. We have our chamfer along in this pocket. That all looks pretty good. We had a number of different choices along the way here as it relates to layers and tool paths, duplicating tool paths, duplicating operations, how to set up sort of a finishing tool path. One thing we don't have so far is tabs. Now tabs have moved if we select our inner contour because we don't want to select our chamfer contour. We want to select our regular contour here. And we want to add tabs. This is the edit and add edit tabs. Now you're going to add tabs wherever you want them. And it's going to be generic. There's no size to these right now. There's no indication of depth nor width. They're just points at this section. In the toolpathing dialog is where you're going to decide how wide or how tall those are going to be, those tabs. The preset is 12 wide and 3 tall. 12 wide is pretty wide. I prefer something more like 3 wide and 3 tall for something that has a fair amount of cutting force on it. You might even go down to 2 if you're cutting half inch. Again, learning and experience will be key to your success with tabs holding on to your product properly and not flinging apart. If you fling a couple parts, you know you're at the edge and it'll happen. And okay, now let's look at our simulation. We've quickly added tabs to what we were doing and now they are appearing with the part. That's definitely going to hold our part very nicely inside of our wood. We're going to end up with a decent product there. Is there anything else you want to add? Maybe, maybe not. This is version one. Generally, you can do about three versions in real life or IRL if you're one of the kids. And you'll have a product that you really like and you're really enjoying. Whatever it may be. This is kind of a silly idea. I'm sure you're designing better things out there. I guess we'll just take this to the machine and see where it goes. I know we're at like an hour but explaining it to you, and the first time you do it, an hour. The next time you do it, 40 minutes. The third time you do it from scratch, half an hour. You can start from nothing and bam, 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 lay everything in a half an hour, you'll be done. All right, let's hit a cutting montage. And then we'll talk about the finished product for just a second. But the main part of this video, already good.
Back here after making the tray itself, I have a few changes already to the tray. It's not bad for a first effort. It really isn't. I think I would definitely store coins flat like this. And this width works fine. I might create individual stacks or I might just leave it the way it is and stack a couple more in. Might be about the same size, maybe a touch less on the width or the height, depending upon how you're looking at it. Now, for these guys, I would make these guys slightly larger. The radius of here, there's a slight variation in the coins, so I would give it a little bit more space so they sit neatly within each one of these holes. This is a silly item to make. It's not really a serious make. It was more about telling you what it's like to design something, the way that I think about it. Is everything that I think about contained in there? No, probably not, because each time I make something different, I think about a couple more things, or I think of a couple things I haven't thought of in a while. The main message is keep making things. Keep making the same thing for, say, two or three iterations so you get used to making changes, you get used to refining an item. Then don't be afraid to make something kind of useless. This will stay here in the office. I'm sure it'll contain coins for the rest of its days. It's not just going in the fireplace. So remember that. Making stuff like this is a fun exercise to improve your skills so that when you go to make something more complex or something you really are proud of or you're going to give as a gift, you build up a bunch of skills on some things where it doesn't matter if it's slightly off. It's still usable. Hope you found some value in this. We'll be back in the studio with more information, ideas, and inspiration.